we're going to be looking at uh, pages 178 through 181 in your catechism today. So make sure you open up to that page in your catechism. We're looking at redeemed, that I should be your own on the top of page 178. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to just review a little bit of humiliation and exaltation. Uh, if you remember, we're talking about Jesus when he comes into uh, this world, and he comes in the crib, goes to the cross. Humiliation doesn't mean you're embarrassed, but it means not using his full power, okay? Not using his full power. So he's allowing things to happen to him in his humiliation, allowing himself to be crucified, looking weak when he's really not weak. And the second one, that exaltation, is the opposite of that. So we would we would say that exaltation then, if we uh, went around here, uh, would be, uh, hold on a second, would be using, using the full power. So um, I'll just underline this here, using full power, and we'll put a line down here, that's what exaltation is, using the full power. So this would be, after his resurrection. So you think of the, the Apostles' Creed, um, but in the Apostles' Creed, it's a little bit off because I asked the question, his first act of exaltation, we said, uh, doesn't seem to be an act of exaltation, but is when he descends, descends into hell because he doesn't go down there to suffer from Satan. But he goes down there to show his victory. So we think of three days after he rose from the, after he died, he rose from the dead, and then on the very early of that Sunday morning, he descends into hell, says to Satan, "I am the champion." So that's really the first act of his exaltation. Um, and then. Forty days after he rises, he ascends into heaven, and he says that he fills everything in every way. So now he is ruling invisibly from the heavens, but also on the earth, and uh, he's working all things out for our good as our ascended Lord, waiting to come back then on judgment day, and nobody knows that day or that hour. And then 50 days after his resurrection. So this is from the resurrection. 50 days afterwards, then you have the gift of Pentecost. And that's when he sends uh, his Holy Spirit on the disciples in tongue, tongues of fire. And he baptizes them to speak in different languages. And that really shows the explosion of the Christian church. So... That's basically the humiliation and exaltation, uh, which we went through last time. Just a quick review of that. So now, let's get to redemption on page 78. That I should be his own. So looking at the top of that, think of it. The eternal, all-knowing, and all-powerful God stepped into human history. And since then, things have never been the same. God took on human flesh. The God-man strapped on human sandals and walked and talked on earth. He lived a humble life. He didn't even have a place to call his home. He was willing to be hated and mistreated. He accepted a painful and the most shameful death, the form of death on a cross. And then he rose from the dead. For such an incredible course of events, there, have, there must have been a reason. And there was. So why did Jesus redeem us is question uh, 175. 175. That's the question we look at. And the passage there in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So when you look at the end of that passage, that we might become the righteousness of God. So if we become something, it's something that we weren't. We become righteous. In other words, we were evil before, we were sinful before, but now in God's sight, we look righteous. And if we look righteous, we look right. We look holy. Okay? That's why he redeemed us, so that we would become righteous in God's sight, before the sight of God. That's why he paid for our sins. Purchased for God 
by his blood. So redeem, remember that word redemption, it means buy back. Jesus uses his blood, pays it to God to pay for our sins, and now we belong to God. Why did he do that? So we would become righteous, okay? 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14, on the bottom of page 178, um, says, Christ gave himself up for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Eager, okay? So you're not lazy, and it's not that you're being dragged to do what is good, but God basically changes you on the inside. So um, if I were forward here, so here you are, and you were, you were contaminated by sin. You were only a self-centered person. It was all about me. Contaminated with sin from head to toe. But Jesus pays for you. He sends the Holy Spirit into you. And now, even though you still have a sinful nature to deal with, it's still a selfish, you look holy in God's sight. He did this to redeem you. How did he do this? With his blood. And now, on the inside, God's Spirit makes you want to do things for God and not for the self and not also for the world and not for flesh, okay? Or not for, uh, scratch that, sorry, not for flesh, but uh, I mean not, not for the devil, okay, not for the devil. So you, your, your, your directions change. You go from self-centered, world-centered, uh, demon-centered to God-centered, okay? That's why he died for you, so that you'd be eager to do what is good. And if you look at 1 Peter 2, verse 9, if you declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So God wants you to praise the Lord to the world. He didn't just die for you for you to be quiet in this world. He died for you that you would praise him and that you would look, you would look, no longer live for yourselves, that you wouldn't even live, but Christ would live in you. So you live by faith. So you, the Christ lives in you. So you have a divine being, God living in you, who drives you to do wonderful things because he saved you from hell. Okay? This is the whole purpose of redemption. Um, so those are some big terms that you would become righteous. That means you become right. You become holy. Those are some things. Um, question 177 there. How is it possible that our service to God could be considered righteous, innocent, and blessed? Okay. Now that's a, that's a picture that God wants us to have. And so I put this. This one on here, this is an old, this is a parable. And Jesus said that this guy uh, came into his wedding feast, but he wasn't wearing wedding clothes, okay? He wanted to sit with everybody else, but he didn't want the free clothes that he was given. He wanted to appear at the wedding as he was. And that's a picture of somebody that wants to appear before God with his own righteousness, with his own holiness. And, God, and, the, and you notice the guy's pointing at him. Okay, he's pointing at him, saying, get out of here. Throw that wicked servant outside into the darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's uh, the story from Luke 19 on page 181. Because he's not wearing a robe, okay? He's not wearing a robe. Oh, that's, that's the wrong story. Sorry, that's not Luke 19. But this is, the, this is the one who's not wearing a robe. So the idea of having a robe of righteousness. Um, let me see if I put that on there. Uh, I didn't put that on there again. But the idea is that you're covered from head to toe. So you look holy in God's sight. Uh, if you look at Titus 2, verse 13, the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Just the ability to say no is an important thing, that you don't say yes to yourself. So if we go back to the selfish picture here, when you're in Christ, you say, no, I'm not going to do the things that I want. It's not about me anymore. Okay? It's about what God wants. Um, and if you keep on looking at that, to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness, 
Um, so it says, Jesus made us righteous by covering us with his robe of righteousness, okay? That's your robe when you're baptized and you believe in Jesus. And it also then says, he kept the law in our place and endured the punishment we deserve. Remember, that's uh, active and passive obedience. And he raises up the new person within us who hates sin and who wants to live a godly life out of thanks for God. This is the new person within. You have an old man and a new person, and the new person within wants to please God. Okay? So, final question here, 178. When will we finally uh, be able to, not, not final question, but when will we finally be able to serve in perfect and everlasting righteousness in this blessedness? Well, that um, is a picture of heaven. If you look back at Revelation 7, 14, verse 15, on top of page 180, these are they who have come out of the tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, be there before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. Um, and then Revelation 14 says, No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. So, um, what gives us confidence? So, the, the point is that as we're serving God, um, as we're serving God and we have a sinful, sinful flesh, old Adam, new man, okay, new self, uh, we're serving God, we realize that as we, we grow, we want to crush this, the old man more and more, and we want our new self to grow more and more, but we'll never be rid of this old man completely in us Not until heaven, and then in heaven, at the resurrection, then you're all new man, new body, new self, and there is no more old self that's gone when you die. It gets buried in the ground, and then you're raised with a new body, and your body and your soul are completely holy, as is not only with a foreign righteousness of holiness in Jesus here, but with your own holiness too in heaven at the resurrection. That's when we can perfectly serve God. And we know we, we know we will do that because God says about what Jesus did. Um, in question 179, it points us to Jesus. So um, if you look at um, that little illustration on 180, that Jesus made us his own to free us from slavery, to live for him, made new by the Spirit, moved by gratitude, it becomes ours by faith, uh, by the work of the Holy Spirit through the gospel of salvation. Um, it, uh, it says that uh, in Philippians 3, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so they'll be like his glorious body. Right there, right there at the resurrection. Okay? Um, we will be just, we will be like Jesus with that resurrection. Now, how does that become ours? Okay, how does this holiness become ours? How does this righteousness become ours? By faith, right? No, sorry, by faith, not by work. So, um, if the bank is representative of, okay, let's, Jesus dies on the cross, and he puts all of his righteousness in here, all of his holiness in here, okay? It's all there for the entire world. The whole payment of sins is made for the entire world. Now the question is, how do I get the money out of the bank? How do I get the righteousness out of the bank? It's there for everyone. Okay, He died for everyone, whether they believe it or not. Their sins are paid for. And in that sense, you could say um, they are forgiven. But they're not credited with that righteousness uh, until... Uh, they receive it by faith, you could say. So looking at Romans 10, 17, it says, Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. So we're going to say, how do I know that my money is in the bank? Okay, well, that goes back to the word. Well, which word? It has to be the word of Christ. So here we're talking specifically gospel. We're talking about the Bible that points to Jesus. So if I don't find Jesus in the Bible, I don't have forgiveness. The only place I have forgiveness is here, and this is found here in the Word. Okay, but you can read the Bible, um, the old the 
some of the Jews don't see Jesus in the Old Testament. I remember how many books there are in the Old Testament. You got 39, right? Three letters in Old, nine letters in Testament. And three times nine is 27 in the New Testament. We find Jesus in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Without Jesus, you have no gospel. Without the gospel, you don't have faith. So the Word of God is that which says to us, um, the Word of God um, says to us, hold on, let me just read this for a second, says, hey, the money's in the bank. You, go and get your money out of the bank. You don't have to break in. You don't have to earn it, okay? It's free. He earned it all, and he wants you to have it free of charge. Believe me, okay? Go get it. It's yours, okay? That's the idea of faith. It's not something that uh, you have to earn, okay? But you need to hear the message, and that's why the Word of God is so important, because faith comes from hearing the message, okay? And the message is heard by the Word of Christ. So that is um, where faith comes from. And so... This picture that I placed here then at the end, this is the story of Zacchaeus. On page 181, I want you to read Luke 19. And the story of Zacchaeus is that he was sitting up in a tree, and he was waiting for Jesus to come by. And he was a tax collector. Nobody really liked him. And he got up in the tree to see Jesus. And when Jesus came by and nobody liked him because they said he was a, he was a greedy tax collector, he said, uh, Zacchaeus, come down, because I'm going to your house today. Zacchaeus said, here, now I give so and so much money to the poor, and um, half, half of my money to the poor, and if I cheat anyone, I'll return it four times. Well, Jesus never said, you have to do that, Zacchaeus, but Zacchaeus did it freely out of love. So he didn't do it in order to be forgiven. He did it because he was forgiven, and that's how faith changes our heart. We want to do things different, and that's part of why Jesus redeemed us. That Luther quote on the bottom 181 says, The little word Lord means simply the same as Redeemer. It means the one who has brought us from Satan to God, from death to life, from sin to righteousness, and who perseveres us in the same. But all the points that follow in this article serve no other purpose than to explain and express this redemption. They explain how and by whom it was accomplished. They explain how much it cost him and what he spent and risked so that he might win us and bring us under his dominion. All right, so that's the end of the questions from 178, uh, page, pages uh, 175 through 181, and, and uh, ends at page 182.